Hello, this is Robert Rickover. I'm an Alexander Technique teacher in Lincoln, Nebraska. I also teach regularly in Toronto, Canada, and but these days I'm just teaching online. Uh, my guest today is Penelope Easton, an Alexander Technique teacher in County Clare, Ireland. Uh, Penelope uh, studied zoology at Cambridge, and she trained as an Alexander Technique teacher. And then she worked for four years with a woman named Margaret Goldie, usually referred to as Miss Goldie, which set her on a 30 year journey to try to figure out what her teaching was all about, how it differed from pretty much everything else that was around in England at that time, and what was the science behind it. She's written a book, which she will now hold up for our viewers, called uh, The Alexander Technique, 12 Fundamentals of Integrated Movement. And I'll put a link to Penelope's website by the interview, by the podcast that will come from it. And it'll show you, teach, show you how to order that book. So welcome to part seven of our series which you, I think will to some extent be a bit of an overview of what we've covered. Um, and I, I thought that it would be maybe useful to think of it as uh, the Alexander technique versus F. Matthias Alexander's discoveries. Mm. Maybe not versus, but What's the difference between the Alexander technique that we all know and love today? And what did Alexander discover? Uh, it's interesting, by the way, that Marjorie Barstow, when she would send out announcements for her summer workshops in Lincoln, Nebraska, back in the day, uh, would say, come to enjoy the discoveries of FM Alexander. And I've used that phrase a lot myself if I want to have a sort of a broader description of what we're doing. Um, from what you said in, in a lot of our previous interviews, uh, Margaret Goldie, Miss Goldie was not happy about what was going on in England at that time, which would, in your case was what the late 80s, in my case, the late 70s, early 80s. And um, she felt, I, I think it's a fair summary, that most teachers were not really teaching what Alexander discovered. They, I, I don't want, I hate to use the word a dumbed down version of it, but of somewhat limited, ver different limited versions of what Alexander himself discovered. Would that, is that, sound right to you yes i i must admit i don't like dumb down <laughs> no no i just said that to but be yes, controversial I, um yeah. yeah that she wasn't happy with what's going on and she was she was angry and about it and it seems like sometimes she took that anger out on students who would show up yep. and <laughs> from what the way you've described mm -hmm. it um so what what do you think that they were just in broad terms? What were these teachers and teacher trainers missing? Yes. Okay. So, yeah, it's not just one thing. I think it's, there's a number of ways of answering that. Mm -hmm. um, one of which. Um, Erica Whitaker, when, who was, of course, on the very first training course, mm -hmm. she commented, she then went off traveling and came back towards the end of, by, by this time it was training course three or something, I think, and um, of Alexander's. And she was aware that it had all become how you use the hands. And Alexander said to her, I think it was to her anyway, um, yes, they all want to know how to use their hands. I'm looking for the one who doesn't. Um, and, you know, training courses, they do a lot of incredibly detailed work about how you use the hands and 
where you position the body in order to use the hands and what you do with your hands. But that wasn't the way Alexander worked. The, the descriptions that one gets from Frank Pierce Jones, the, um, and certainly what Erica taught us, which was that he stood back and he looked from this you know, place of total integration that he got because he was working on himself all the time, and that he just let his intuition, in a sense, I think one could call it, let him draw him to where he was needed, of which the hands were the connector, but the real work was being done in the thinking. And, oh, and, and originally, the, the hands were not the connector. There were, oh, it was just uh, he didn't use exactly. his hands at all. And certainly, yeah. to the extent he, I mean, Del Sartre, this Del Sartre process of Francois Del Sartre, which seems to have influenced him a great deal, um, yeah. Del Sartre did not use hands to, to teach. Yeah. Yeah. And what we've said in earlier podcasts is that Alexander didn't start using his hands in this directing information way until 90, somewhere between 1912 and 1914. So he'd been teaching without hands for 20 years, using thinking and directing. And, um, and as we've, we've said before, it was about spatial awareness, it was about seeing and then just, you know, allowing something to come about. There's a lovely passage, Frank Pierce Jones asked AR, but where should I put my hands? And AR said, put them where they're needed. It's like, well, what does that mean? But but that's what I think what Erica was showing us, that you just stand back and you look. Uh, Goldie was always letting go of me and walking away. You know, and I was used, I was used to teachers coming up side on to me at the beginning of a lesson and staying either side on or behind me, side on behind me, side on behind me, maybe going down to my legs, but they never moved further than a foot away from me. They were right next to me the whole time. Commu listening through the hands to what was needed and you know really sort of working through the hands and it's great work but it's not what as I understand it what Alexander and Goldie were doing they were standing back so that they were taking in the whole picture and I think the danger even if I can you know go there is to say when we we can get too over involved with shoulders and too over involved with knees because we're listening through the hands and we don't actually um you know even we forget to, we start working on specifics even and i think it becomes a bit more again if i can stick my neck out people aren't reaching the core muscles you know when goldie put hands on you you were just there the whole of you was there because she was there the whole of in herself she wasn't trying to feel it out with the hands she was finding it in herself and then communicating at that. But she was still communicating it. She'd wander off to her clock because, you know, she'd take me back in the chair in this lovely, strong way. She'd get my back working, take me back to an angle, and then walk off and look at her clock. And <laughs> what is going on well, here? Yeah. Um, so, well, here's a. Here's a. Thinking going. Here's a. a, a, a a question and it leads to a thought of mine. It's, so at some point, uh, Alex, Alexander um, became frustrated, I think, with using verbal instructions, perhaps directions of some sort. And, this, and in a way, he got around that by starting to use his hand somewhere, I think, again, it's in Frank Pierce Jones, where he says, you know, he can't comes in one day and announces, well, you know what, I can get it for him. I, I, he, he's a sort of essentially saying, you know, these people aren't really, they're not getting the directions properly. Mm -hmm. And so, so I can just get it for them with my hands and it'll just make life easier for, for all of us. I mean, Even that, as late, I sorry? There's a passage in Lily Westfeld where she says, yes, Lily one day Westfeld. he came in and says this, and she said after that I saw him much happier. Yeah, and also uh, on his training course, he uh, he was interviewed, uh, his first training course, he was interviewed by uh, George Trevelyan, I think his first name is George, right, mm -hmm. who uh, did, a, did a really nice little article on that, it was in, it's not widely available, but 
he quotes Alexander as saying, none of my students will believe that all they have to do is think the thought and that'll do the trick. He, he actually puts it that way. And he says, the trouble is, he says they are all slaves to their muscles. Something, something along mm -hmm. those lines. Now, yeah. I, I've thought a lot about that and about that transition to hands. And I just wonder, to me, it seems like maybe the problem was students not being able to implement his directions the way he had hoped they would. Maybe the problem was that his directions were not the best directions, not the best way of saying them to people. I don't think he understood. Um, I don't think he, his linguistic technique, let's put it that way, was that good. I don't think he was really mm. good at coming up with useful directions. And I think the directions that he used initially, and we don't exactly know what they are, but it, apparently at some point he he's talked about, um, well, he would say things like neck free, right? Uh, and then at some point he switched over to um, letting my neck be free and that seemed like a big improvement. To me, both those, certainly letting my neck be free, telling someone to let their neck be free, to me, at this point in my teaching career seems like an absolutely terrible direction because it makes an assumption that just is not true in most cases. Most people don't know how to let their neck be free and to tell them to do it is almost as bad as telling them to stand up straight or whatever. And I think he didn't really understand how the brain works fully in terms of direction versus implementation of direction. I, I, don't I think th that's an interesting point because, um, you know, now we have the analogy of computers. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, we know that if you write a program, if you want to send a rocket to the moon, you don't write the program in the rocket. No. You write the program in the lab. And then when the program is written, you take the program to the rocket and you fire the rocket. Um, and the program then organizes the rocket. And it's like, it's such a useful analogy that the, we write the program up here. It's a flawed analogy, I might say. It's not the whole story, but I right. think it's a, better, it's a better idea than, I, I think they didn't understand, as you say, that distinction between thinking and that, that you have, you have that the brain actually can integrate it. And then it can send several directions in all directions at once. Um, I think I think you're absolutely right that there's a whole set of technology that that FM didn't have, and the knowledge of how the brain worked was one of it. The, the knowledge that everything actually works in networks, of course, is very recent. And then he didn't have his functional anatomy either. You know, he did have a look at anatomy at one point. He went, "Don't like that. Don't yeah. like what the anatomists are doing," and left it behind. But once you look at functional anatomy where things join up, it makes much more sense. And then you can discover what these precisions of points were. So I think, you know, we've only just, say my, my book is packed full of the science behind it, how we think, how the direction, how the nervous system organizes movement, where reflexes fit in, because they're not the whole story, um, where the biodynamics fits in, try to put the whole, and try to put the whole picture together of all the science. That could that can only have been written in the last ten years. It couldn't have been written before that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, as so, I think Alexander, that there, you know, he, he people had a hard time using the directions that he taught them. And why not just use my hands to to fix them? But yeah. but as. Um, Paul Collins, who was one of the directors of my training course, which was a second gen, the first second generation training course, sponsored by Walter Walter Carrington, uh, said in a little meeting of students, we were talking about that very passage where he says, "Well, I can just get it for him." Paul was in a 
Paul said, you know, that was a pretty dangerous moment. Mm -hmm. And I think he was absolutely right about that because I think what's happened is you get you get now you get teachers that's pretty much all they do is use their hands or some teachers mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I've noticed when I when I get a new student uh, who who's had lessons, I always ask them. I ask them, well, who did they study with? I'm curious. And then I ask them. I ask them, well, do you? what's your take on Alexander technique directions? Do you know about them? And do you use them when it's appropriate? Very few students have any idea how to use directions. Though some of them will say, I never heard the term before. That's not surprising. Some will say, oh, that's what my teacher used when they taught me. It, and a few of them said, I sort of vaguely remember, but I don't, I wouldn't necessarily know how to use directions. And to me, that seems like a really serious gap. Yeah. And my first teacher uh, was of the hands on only with very limited speaking, partly because his English wasn't, wasn't very good. And when I started reading about the technique, because I was fascinated, because all these wonderful things were happening to me from his hands, I asked him, uh, well, uh, when are we going to get to directions? And he said, oh, not, not for a long time. That's only for very advanced people. But you see here, I think we've got the nub of it that we hadn't uh, we hadn't worked out how to communicate. As you say, Alexander yeah. hadn't worked it out right at the start. He did his best. I mean, neck free. There's seven joints in the neck. Excuse right. me, which one are we using? What are we freeing? It, it's it's too, way too unspecific. Back back widen. I mean, there's at least five points that the back can widen. Right. Back lengthen. Well, at least at least back lengthen makes more sense. But even so, you've got to lengthen this bit and this bit and this bit. Um, you know, they're way too unspecific. And again, this is where understanding the anatomy comes in. So you actually can say to people, well, neck free actually means the occipital joint, but it also means coming up out of T8. Um, you know, so there was that whole confusion for starters because Alexander was thinking of the neck as freeing right from the center, from that point between the shoulder blades. Mm -hmm. And McDonald decided it meant that bit. So mm -hmm. something got lost at that moment. So I think there's a lot of points at which things got lost because they weren't understood well enough to be articulated. I think there's masses and masses and masses that Alexander actually did know, but he just, he didn't even realize what he knew. You know, I think like the spatial awareness with the eyes thing, he was using it, but his eyesight was good. So he had no reason to realize what he was doing because you know, it's those of us who were short-sighted and had to fight our way back to spatial awareness that go, wow, spatial awareness. But if you've always had spatial awareness, and he, after all, he spent half his childhood because he got thrown out of school, lying on a hillside watching animals and being in nature. So he would have had that amazing spatial awareness. So why would he even mention it? Because if you don't lose something, you don't know it's there. Mm -hmm. So I think... You know, he, he, he couldn't articulate it because he didn't even know it was there. So I think there's all sorts of things like that that he and things he was doing and didn't articulate. Um, I would I'm going to really stick my neck out here. I think only 50 percent of what Alexander was doing has come down to us. 50 percent is perhaps a, a figure plucked out of the air. It but might be a, a but limited amount. Yeah, a limited amount. we actually haven't got the whole story. Right. And each, each of the each of the those main training course directors, they also took their bit. Did I tell you right. about what Goldie said about the elephant? Um, tell you us, because I, yeah. I, I, you did tell me, but let's tell our audience, because it's yeah. I think it's very appropriate. It's, it's, it's juicy, actually, because, you know, when, on my training course, we were always asking, you know, was who, which, who, which of them have the right answer? Because Mr. McDonald's training course were doing something so different from the Carrington's and something so different from the Barlow's. And we found it so difficult to work on each other because such different work was going on. Um, and, you know, who, who, who actually had the right answer? 
So I asked Miss Goldie this one day, you know, which of Carrington, MacDonald and Barlow has, has what Alexander was doing? And she said, my dear, you know the story of the three blind men and the elephant. So I, I, did, I knew the story, but I'll just explain it for those who don't. The three blind men going to see the elephant and one puts its hands on the trunk and goes, oh, the elephant's like a snake. And another puts their hands on the flank and goes, oh, the elephant's like a wall. And another puts their hands on the on the tail and goes, the elephant's like a rope and you could go on. And yeah. I think everybody took their bit of the technique. And of course, there's been wonderful work done since of the McDonald people going to the Carrington people and the Barlow people and saying, OK, so what's the bit that you got that we guys didn't and mm -hmm. trying to put it all together? And I think places like Australia, you know, probably have got a more integrated blend from the start, maybe even America. I don't know. Certainly in Britain, they stayed a lot more, you know, apart, except for Don Burton's schools um, that tried to, he, he was the first one to try and get, you know, everybody working in the same room. Um, but even with that, you see, I don't think you get the whole picture because of the stuff that never made it even into the training courses, mm -hmm. the stuff that Miss Goldie had and the stuff that Alexander was doing that even Goldie didn't know about, that mm -hmm. Alexander never articulated, the stuff that goes right back to the beginning. Um, I mean, Goldie worked with me on breathing. It's interesting you, you talk about directions like that. She worked with me on breathing, but she never told me how to do this natural breathing. It was John Hunter who told me how to do the, the breathe out, stay there and wait. And the, the natural, the nervous system will integrate it and will show you how to breathe. Um, and I asked Ted McNamara once, you know, did Goldie work with you on breathing? And she said, he said, well, Yes, she did. Well, will you show me? Oh, it's only for very advanced students. Yeah, yeah, now, yeah. I work with that because I've got a methodology now for doing it. I can be working with that methodology on people in their second, their third, their fourth lesson. Mm -hmm. I think once you've got yeah. a methodology, yeah. oh, absolutely. you can introduce yeah. it straight away. And we can then yeah. actually teach it. But we've been lacking methodologies. Yeah. I think that's a pretty fair statement. So um, given this gap between what Alexander discovered for himself and what he, what Miss Goldie felt uh, was going on with present day at that time teachers, how do you, and not being happy about it, seeing it as less good, let's say, than what Alexander discovered, how do you reconcile that with Alexander's statements in two or three places to the effect in, in his books? I think the most the strongest version, I believe it's in, in MSI, where he says, I would like nothing better than to do away with teachers like me, that my place in in the present world or present economy uh, shouldn't be there. It, it, we shouldn't, you shouldn't need people like me to, to, to deal with these kind of uh, problems that I am addressing. I think maybe in the back of his mind was something like, well, you know, if we taught our kids properly, they wouldn't get into this problem yeah. in the first place and so on. How do you reconcile that with this gap that's appeared where, at least from Ms. Goldie's point of view, things have gone have gone downhill? Yes. Um, I mean, it's a wonderful ideal, isn't it, that, that we actually teach. I mean, I think we all hold that as a secret dream, that someday there'll be an Alexander Technique teacher in every school, that the teachers themselves will have been trained in it. Or parents, or parents on that learn parents enough been, and they'll the just, parents will have all been taught before they even birth the child. Right. I mean the, the, the thing that the thing goes so far back, doesn't it? Yeah. And actually it's such yeah. a huge problem because I'm also a nutritionist. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that strikes me is you go into a supermarket and you have a small section labeled health foods. Right. How about labeling all the rest of the supermarket illness foods? <laughs> yes, you know, well, <laughs> that would probably are. not be a good marketing technique, but no, but it, it, it might be uh, some valid for certain certain parts of what they're selling. But it, but it, 
illustrates the 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 scope the scope the scope of the problem. Yeah. That the health market is this big, and the illness market is this big, and I think we're up in I think we're up to in the same up against the same thing when we try and introduce our concept that we are a very small voice shouting in a you know whispering into a a great maelstrom which is increasingly led by fitness trainers saying this is how you get your core working and this is what you should do and this is how you you know you can take a longer stride by buying these shoes and right. you need these gadgets and all of which is tremendous for making money because you then need you know performance drinks to go with it and foods that give you extra oomph because <laughs> you know, do you really, there was, um, you know, those, those runners in the, in Mexico who, who run a, they're a tribe that are, yeah, average, they run 50, 100 <laughs> miles, whatever, <laughs> through rough terrain, probably yeah. not wearing shoes. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it's. Yeah. And I once watched a trainer, you know, on a YouTube video, there's this trainer saying, but where does he get the, 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 the 50,000 calories that you need to run a hundred miles? And I'm thinking you're missing something here. Yeah, he's not using that count. many calories. He's yeah. not using that many calories. Yeah. You know, so there's a whole disjunct of thinking going on. So right. we're doing our best. Every teacher out there is doing their best. Right. I mean, I don't, I have no blame for anybody, right. no blame for anybody in the entire system. What happened was what happened. And I think it happened for historical reasons because of the lack of science, because of the lack of understanding, because of the Chinese whispers, because of political splits that happened. You know, there's a whole multitude of reasons why we've ended up where we are. And right, not just political, uh, per personal animosities of the, that's true. Yeah, that's uh, which true. go back to the 30s. And they, yeah. they when I was they there, they were still complaining yeah. uh, about them. But um, yeah. Yeah, and, and but the, but how about that. how about this theory of what went on? Maybe, and I'm not saying I'm not saying Alexander was conscious of it in quite this way, but maybe the only way to preserve at least some of what he discovered was to create a, something that was kind of like a technique. I don't believe he ever used that phrase himself, but something that could be packaged and taught on a training course for teachers and that teachers could then work with people in the public. And it would have enough of what he discovered to be useful, but also not so much that it well, enough to keep it as a coherent process that could then be replicated and continued on into the future. Because really, if you were if you were living in, let's say you were living in 1930 and you had lessons with Alexander, and it's amazing, right? This guy, right? He's just, uh, it might also have seemed to you likely that in another 40 or 50 years, no one would have any idea about this guy. I mean, he, he would have, you know, he wrote these books that no one would have, would know about 50 mm -hmm. or a hundred years later, but well, now it is almost a hundred years later and we do yeah. know about him and we know about the books. We don't necessarily know all the stuff he, came up with, but we know some stuff and with some. Well, the 50 percent we've got is a jolly good. It's pretty good. But yeah, but it could be better. Good. It could be it a could, lot better. That's that's the point. There is yeah. more. It's not even better. There is more, you know. Yeah, why not, there's why more not have to it. it. Why, not, why not have the whole elephant? Why be stuck with half the elephant? Why right, the whole right, elephant? right. I don't think it was Alexander who thought like that. I think it was his followers. And the training course people, I think it was McDonald and, and yeah. you know, Barlow between them who put that package together and enabled something to become a technique that got passed down. And that is the other difference between Goldie and what was happening in the training schools is that she was staying with his discovery process. 
and she uh, she was staying with this process and she was not promoting herself people would yeah. find her she did not yeah. have a training course and yeah. people would find her and she was happy when they found i mean she would do what she could when she but she did not try to preserve it in that way and uh, you know there's a little parallel there with marjorie barstow i mean i think marjorie barstow uh w was one of those elephant um people but i think marge I t marge had a quite a different set of discoveries from alexander and then she just worked on herself and worked on herself she told me she I, never she never would they would never go by in her life when she wasn't exploring alexander's discoveries mm -hmm. starting in the, you know f from the early 20s when she had her first lessons with him it just it was her main life, although she did other things. She ran businesses and ranches and stuff. I mean, she was not just an Alexander te teacher for a long time. But I think she did take the discovery process, you see, because again, she was part of that. She, she, she absorbed what Irene Tasker was giving, mm -hmm. which is that, you know, how you work on yourself while you're frying onions. Well, she yeah, was way. very much application oriented yes, in her right. teaching and, I, and very I practical. People, she was the, practical, probably yeah. the most practical person in a way yeah. and the most aware person you could imagine yeah. in her own And I think way. Erica Whitaker had that as well, but of course mm -hmm. she never had a training course and she didn't even have the number of students that Marge had. Mm -hmm. um, and Marjorie Barlow took a little bit of that away as well. Mm -hmm. But and I don't know what Carrington had of that, but McDonald, I don't think, was interested in that side at all. And so mm -hmm. that side is completely missing from uh, uh, that was my experience anyway, that that's missing from his side. Um, and, you know, it's the, again, I've turned I've turned that discovery process into a methodology of discovery process right. by working out the thinking processes and the brain processes, this whole right brain thing right. and the spatial awareness thing by which you can find the discovery process and the breathing. It's also a discovery process. You breathe out and you have to wait, right. but you have to know how to get your mind out of the way to let that happen. You know, there are, so I've put methodologies on a lot of this stuff that's never had methodologies put, it, put on it before, as well as science, as well as anatomy. I've also put methodologies on it. That's well, here, here's another, here's a what if question. Yes. Um, I don't know whether it was John Doe or someone else said, really, Alexander's major contribution was not the Alexander technique, but keeping del sartre's original ideas alive because well, that would be jean doe, because it well, yeah, would be jean doe saying that i imagine yeah. because his take on it is that the del sartre that merged later in the 19th century that's the, kind of the only one that most people know about really has very little to do with what Francois del Sartre was doing or it even what time. his younger brother who emigrated yeah. to Tasmania and obviously influenced Alexander was doing and that if it, it might have been helpful in some ways if Alexander had referenced this guy um he didn't write any books del sartre but there are notes that he wrote that apparently have been published now he it might have been helpful if he had sort of awoken the world to this french guy from the 1840s and so on but he didn't be, for various reasons partly because maybe when he got to england that might not have been the best strategy for attracting students oh, you know uh, better yeah. off that he, i think you said this better off to be the self-made man a uh, yeah. unique guy from australia that's got the, but but we're gonna we're gonna drop australia off the equation as quickly as we can oh, by, by getting a, by developing a nice british accent because he didn't really want to be seen as an australian right um that so was he, back he before dropped, before australia then. was a happening place <laughs> before it was the land of oz it was just a penal colony or an ex-penal colony anyway uh you know it's it 
it might have been different if he had embraced Del Sartre a bit publicly and gotten people to think about what Del Sartre discovered, because Del Sartre did see the same stuff that Alexander saw. Yeah, he could. He, he, and he also, I mean, I don't know how much of, you, of the Del Sartre stuff you've read. It's it's weird to modernize. I mean, there's all this stuff about spirit and mind, and it's it's highfalutin, and there's diagrams of the universe. And but I don't think that necessarily was what Francois was teaching. Oh, wait, but it was, you see. Was it? Was. it what he was adding yeah, that stuff was. to it, but he was yes. also using mirrors. Yes, and, that's and, right. There was yeah. the physical and the the physical side of what Del of what Del Sartre was doing. Right. And, the, and the thinking to to do with the body has come down through Alexander, but you know, inspired by Jando, I have looked now at a number of Del Sartre things. It's jolly hard to read. I mean, there's just pages and pages and pages of it that have no relevance to us whatsoever. And then you come across a sentence right. and about the law of oppositions or yeah. the law of dynamic wealth, and that you, or that you've got to think. You can't you can't do it from the body. You have to think. But even so, it's written very much in 19th century language. So in a way, I'm not surprised that Alexander dropped the Del Sartre because mm -hmm. that sort of, you know, diagrams of the cosmos was the sort of thing that was happening in the 1840s. I mean, if you look at a number of other, I can't name their names now, but there's a lot of, I heard, I went to a talk on it once and the man was talking about Del Sartre, but also showing what all these other philosophers were doing. They were all doing this sort of stuff, right. very highfalutin spiritual stuff. Right. But Del Sartre actually brought a physical aspect into it that Alexander rescued and brought on. Right. And, and Alexander did not want to reference the uh, what was probably Del Sartre's major in interest, really. Yeah. I think Jean Doe once said he his work was to get people to be better performers. And he was aware that it might help them in their lives, but he had no interest in that aspect yeah. of it. No, no, he was he, interested he, he in the, thing, the gestures and all that. Yeah. So but he, anyway. But he did because he linked up emotion and gesture and speech. And right, his right. Is, is, is integration of the body and the mind. Right. Um, but Alexander, so there was a point where Alexander took off from Del Sartre, I think. Took yeah. the essentials, but really understood them and developed them. Um, you know, and started really to understand oppositions, and mm -hmm. you know, we did understand you had to think, you couldn't do it from the body. Um, right. So I think there was a, and and we've got a, we, we've always got to keep hold of that, haven't we? That that sort of interplay that we we use, which is actually so difficult to describe between the physical and the nervous right. system, between right. the physical structures and the thinking. And I think we should give Alexander credit for coming up with the idea of directions. I just think his directions weren't that great. But the idea that your mind could project these thoughts and if and yeah. uh, they would, that's all you had to do, really, the rest of your body would take care of. He just didn't have good ones, but or as good yeah. as I think we have today. But yeah. Well, but even, but even the biomechanical directions, as I say, I've, uh, there's, there's a section in the book where I give, you know, the 12 different ways, actually, that you can use for freeing the neck and all the all the different pulls that you can use to expect to widen the back. I mean, there, there's, there's far more going on in those, you know, right. neck free and, and back widened than I think is, is, is acknowledged. And when you, yeah. you again, there's, there's far more to it. And it's been a process of Chinese whispers as well, hasn't it? That stuff's come down to us and not been understood, and then it's been passed on in a, another form. I think oh, I'm sure there's a lot, a lot of that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So there's a lot of that that's happened as well. So we're all there's a you know I'm not the only one out there. You're not the only one out there. But we're trying to you know find it and pull it back together. What was Alexander doing? But I find myself also asking you know okay we're not a therapy but acupuncture. Mm -hmm. You know, how many generations did it take to put the whole acupuncture picture together? Mm -hmm. You know, that wasn't done by one man in one year, in one lifetime, was it? Because there's what 12 meridians and five elements, and there's a, and all the different ways that all the points, and they must have been working on that stuff for centuries before really they'd got something that was really teachable and passable down. And now you go to an acupuncturist and they go, yep, that's your liver meridian and that's it. And you can right. learn it in three years. But it must have taken a lot of generations to put that package together. Well, tra traditional, traditional Chinese medicine, which is people are practicing that now, 
mm -hmm. uh, goes back around 4,000 years. Exactly. And, and so it's been it's worked, on, a and worked thing, on and worked yeah. on. It's not a new thing, exactly. And it's been worked on and evolved and worked on and evolved. And, you know, we're needing to do that with the technique. You know, Goldie told me that at the end of his life, Alexander was asked, you know, have you done it? And he said, oh, no, I'm only halfway through. Well, he, he does say somewhere, I hope that my work will be seen as a, a signpost for mm -hmm. future generations. They will see where I was, what I was interested in and where I was heading and makes it very clear that he never felt he was anywhere near sure. the end of, of yeah. what, what was possible. Yeah, he was very clear about that. But I think we are beginning to understand it. I mean, the paper that Tim Cacciatore and Rajal Cohen and Patrick Johnson did last year, mm -hmm. where they actually put the scientific model of the Alexander together. And, and actually the, measured a thing. This, this is like yeah. such an, that, that, that work is so important because the, yeah. the postural tone stuff, because yeah. they actually measured the effects of Alexander lessons, not by people reporting on, oh, I felt better, my back pain went away, actual measurement of postural tone. And I think, I think it's a shame that that stuff isn't better known because that really is powerful. I talk about Yeah, and I do think there's a lot of, oh, I mean, I think, I think bottom line, we should all be really grateful for Alexander for what he did, what he tried to do, where he didn't do as well as he might have, and for all those teachers who carried on the work. Um, and brought it down to us. And brought it down to us. And um, maybe we should end on that nice positive note. What do you think? Yeah, I think okay, I let's do that. Um, so my guest today has been Penelope Easton, an Alexander Te Technique teacher in County Clare, Ireland. She's written a book, which she will hold that up once again, uh, called The Alexander Technique, 12 Fundamentals of Integrated Movement, based largely, I think, on her work with Miss Goldie and further discoveries of hers. I'll put a link to her website by the interview. You can order the book. You can send her an email and ask her a question, I imagine. Um, so uh, Penelope, thank you so much, not just for this, but for the previous six uh, interviews we've done. Um, thank you so I think much. They're well. a real contribution to Alexand for Alexander teachers and, and serious students of the work. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Facilitating. Yeah.